All right, see, it's on the hour, so take it away. Yay. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I think I'm sharing it already. I'm going to go in present mode. I'm on my laptop, so I can't see everybody, but uh, I think best probably to wait for questions at the end, otherwise it might get confusing given the nature of webinars. So uh, I'll take questions at the end. Some of the questions I probably won't be able to answer. Uh, I've been working on our big event coming up in March, uh, Cloud Next, and uh, haven't spent much time working on Kubernetes in the last couple of months. Uh, but I have three years of experience ever since it came out, I've been working with Kubernetes. Uh, and this talk is basically uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, view of Kubernetes, um, and specifically in the context of building cloud-native applications. <clears throat> and if you're building with something like Kubernetes, you're automatically almost building cloud native applications uh, not quite necessarily uh, the idea of cloud native is building things specifically for uh, the cloud uh, as opposed to using traditional infrastructure and lifting and shifting that stuff into the cloud uh, so <clears throat> that's what we're going to be talking about today uh, and i guess stan if there's any issues that come your way please stop me and i'll address them but uh otherwise i'm just going to plow plow on all right, so, and again, as I say, I, I, this is gonna be hard to be interactive as I can't see anybody, but um, I will talk to my screen. I, I often have a picture of a crowd of people that I can see and talk to those instead, which helps a little bit. I won't be able to do that today. All right, okay, so I, I always like to provide a little bit of background, quite a bit of background actually, into why why we're doing this thing, why why Kubernetes, why is it a thing, and why do we care? Uh, and I have to do that in the context of Google, uh, because really that's where it came out of. Uh, and I think other companies are starting to wake up to the same realization, or have been over the last decade or so, uh, that traditional infrastructure just doesn't cut it when it comes to scale. And uh, back in April 1999, we found ourselves in this situation uh, where we've been going very, very rapidly on very strong growth uh, up to about 500,000 users in just five months, um, uh, 500,000 queries per day, sorry, in, uh, in just five months. And uh, that kind of rate of growth is really hard to sustain with traditional infra. Uh, so we went through various different iterations of things, uh, including uh, starting to run our own data centers. Uh, and at some point we ended up with plans at least for something like this. Uh, this is one of our bigger uh, bigger uh, uh, data centers in Council Plus Iowa. And we hadn't quite reached this yet, but we knew when we would get to this point, uh, it's just really impossible to deal with this kind of stuff the way you would do normally. Uh, there are thousands, tens of thousands of machines in our clusters. And uh, for a software engineer to have to deal with that kind of uh, complexity, uh, where to run stuff is really hard. And so there was some things going on at the time. Uh, and what we wanted to be able to do ultimately was make it very simple for software engineers uh, to access all of that infrastructure, uh, stick a simple control plane in front of it and have software engineers deploy stuff to the control plane and have it take care of all of the details. And uh, that's what we kind of come up with, but everything wasn't in place to begin with. Uh, Containerization have been kicking off. Uh, there have been Chiru initially, uh, and then BSD jails. Uh, I used to work for some microsystems when Solaris zones were really popular uh, back in 2004 or so. Uh, <clears throat> so containerization was really kicking in. Hypervisors were around, uh, virtualization, uh, VMs and such like are already there. Uh, but the full story for containers wasn't really there yet. And the kind of things that pulled all of that together into Linux application containers uh, were things like uh, Chiroots, uh, capabilities, and then ultimately namespaces and C groups. And those last two uh, particularly help very much with, do you guys know the Mr. Men? I don't know, I, I did this before. The Mr. Men are very popular in the UK, but uh, I'm not sure if you've seen these guys before, but I love them. Uh, <clears throat> this is Mr. Noisy. Uh, so C groups and namespaces can help with noisy neighbors. Uh, they can also help with nosy neighbors and also help with messy neighbors. So all of this is about isolation, uh, about making sure that you're not impacted by what the work of what other people are doing. Um, and this is both important in a multi-tenant environment and also in a single tenant environment. And another part of the puzzle was this idea of images. And again, this is going back a long time. Uh, statically linked bundles, things that carried all of their dependencies with them. Uh, by that time, we were riding the crest of the wave of the dynamic linking. And 
uh, dynamic, dynamic linking uh, is great uh, to a degree, uh, but it also has some real issues when it comes to dependencies and managing dependencies. So the idea of a statically linked bun bundle allowed us to encapsulate all of the application environment into uh, something that we could move around everywhere. Uh, and then you combine those two together, you have signed static bundles plus Linux containers. Uh, you now have the ability to isolate applications from those many, many different environments in which they run. Uh, and that's where we got to. And we had a lot of, we did a lot of work on namespaces and C groups, uh, and that's ultimately what made uh, the modern Linux container uh, possible. And then it was the way we actually ran the containers. Uh, containers were, you know, I'll get to something important in a second, but at this point we had uh, two systems. We had a global work queue and we had something called Babysitter. Uh, we would run batch workloads on our global work queue and ba uh, Babysitter would run all of our production workloads. Um, and uh, this is where terms like nanny came along, where we have a, a nanny for all of our running processes that make sure that it runs uh, and ca continues to run. Uh, there are some problems with this model as well. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'm going to kind of give you some very quick comparisons. What we decided to do was combine those two together into what is known as a Borg cell. And Borg is our cluster manager, uh, our, effectively the orchestration component, and our initial equivalent of Kubernetes today. Uh, so we combined all of this uh, together. We now run our batch workloads and our production workloads on the same machines, in the same cells, in the same clusters, in the same data centers. Uh, and that's interesting uh, because that doesn't necessarily sound particularly optimal, but it is, and there are various reasons for that. And the first is that we, again, this seems like a no-brainer for the most part, but we do run multiple applications per, per machine. Uh, so we're not just like dedicated virtual machine slices uh, for specific applications, we're running multiple applications per machine. And the sweet spot of around 50% on this CDF here is about uh, nine, uh, nine applications per machine. And how does sharing clusters between prod and batch help? Well, if we look at our non-prod workloads, uh, which is the light blue bar at the top, and our production workloads, we can compress them and compact them down to the minimum number of machines that we need to be able to run them. And if we did that uh, with them separate, separated, it would look like this. Uh, we would have that gray bar at the top, and we'd have a little bit of overhead uh, left over after we compressed them. Uh, and by the way, if you need me on Twitter or anything like that, uh, at TechGirl, you can ask me questions that way. But you can also ask questions via uh, Stan directly as well. So we have these uh, non-prod and prod-only uh, uh, workloads compacted. If we were, are to combine them together uh, and run them both on a shared cell, we get much, much better comp compaction. And now this is where we're running um, non-production and production workloads on the same cell. You can see that we've compacted this down significantly and uh, this effectively saves us potentially around 25% of the machines that we run. Uh, so that's an important differentiator as why we would run prod and batch together on the same machines. So uh, this next graphic, uh, again, it's not literally a slide for a while, but this graphic shows uh, exactly what the difference is in terms of the overhead uh, from the previous model to this model, this shared model, around 25%. Okay, so that's what benefits we get from it. Uh, and this is all managed by Borg, our cluster scheduler. Uh, all of the ability to be able to make this work uh, is managed by that uh, particular piece of technology that we created. And another thing as well is that we like to think about overcommit significantly. And if you look at the, the, the squiggly bar at the bottom there, it's actual resource consumption uh, of running processes. But when we have our engineers schedule work, uh, on to Borg, onto our, uh, onto our machines via Borg, uh, they have to specify how much resource they, they, they believe they're going to need for that process. And that's what's called the limit. And as you can see, the limit is fairly optimistic. It's much higher than the actual resource used. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> they want to make sure that there's a significant overhead in case of the spikes in traffic. Uh, so the limit <clears throat> is always going to be higher than the amount of resource that's being used. And what we can do and what we've been able to do over the uh, last 10 years or so with Borg is very, very accurately predict or estimate uh, the future usage uh, of all of our running tasks <clears throat> within a cell. 
And so we calculate this thing called a reservation on an ongoing basis. And that's that blue line there. As you can see, it encompasses all of the running work, uh, workloads. It may sometimes be off. Uh, but we, can we can deal with that. Uh, we're over committing generally. Uh, but that blue bar represents what we think we're going to use. And now this gap between the dark blue line at the top and the light blue line is potentially reusable. Uh, we can reuse that resource uh, for other things. And what we use it for is uh, batch jobs, uh, jobs of a very low priority, things that can be preempted effectively. And that's represented in this uh, graphic here, which shows uh, reasons why tasks have been evicted uh, from a machine uh, within a cell. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail about some of these things, but uh, it just does represent exactly what's going on here. Uh, you look at prod, which is the top bar, uh, we have a uh, very, very low uh, eviction rate, and most of those evictions are scheduled machine shutdowns. Uh, so we're going to be scheduled or rescheduling these tasks anyway, uh, because we're taking the machine down for maintenance. Uh, sometimes they get preempted and obviously there are production tasks that are lower priority than other production tasks and sometimes they may get taken out but it's very rare. If you look at the bottom bar uh, you'll see the non-production workloads where we have a significant amount of preemption and that's because they're all running in that, that green area there uh, which may be re need, needed by the actual production workloads. And also we have the other bars at the end, I won't go into those details. But you can see that we, we, we effectively preempt uh, some non-production non workloads very frequently. And the other thing, the other factor that we really care about is uh, the ability to bin pack. Uh, and this means that we, when we take those nine, those nine tasks, we're effectively using all of the resources on a specific node, a specific cluster node. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, diagram or picture here, uh, you'll see represented uh, running virtual machines within our cluster. These are virtual machines on Google Cloud Platform uh, and they're being made available to users, but they appear just as tasks running on Borg. Uh, at the top you can see uh, CPU usage and the bottom you can see memory usage. And if you look at the big black bar in the middle, that's one machine. Uh, if you look to the left though, uh, you see the orange, uh, you'll see that this is for one machine, uh, you'll see that where we have spare CPU, we also have spare memory, which is great because we can schedule stuff there. Uh, if you look at the purple stuff, I'm not sure why it's purple, it should really be red. <laughs> uh, but you can see that here we have CPU or memory that's been used where there is no corresponding uh, of the other. Uh, so where we have CPU being uh, available, we have no memory available, or we have memory available, we have no CPU available. And what this means is that we can't schedule any work there. Uh, so what we need to be able to do is effectively bin pack to make those bars uh, the same, a match uh, on both sides. So where we have CPU available, we have memory available. And so we have advanced uh, bin packing algorithms that calculate that. Um, and this is all available in our Borg white paper. Uh, all of this information I've just given you is available in our Borg white paper, uh, which the link is on the next page. So yeah, so for Borg, this is why we do all of this stuff and why we have Kubernetes. Uh, efficiency comes from a various, uh, various different uh, things that we care about. Scavenging unused allocations, uh, over committing, uh, prioritization, sharing resources, very, very smart scheduling and bin packing. Uh, and we take an application-centric application, application -centric, uh, view of the world and not machine-centric. Uh, it just works better for us. Uh, we launch over 2 billion containers per week uh, go Google on our infrastructure. And that's the bald white paper. It's a long read. Uh, I think I've summarized it reasonably well, but it's lots of good stuff in there. All right, so the conclusion is that we, in order to be able to, book, uh, to build Borg, and this is what we saw, we saw that we would need something like Borg to go back to that picture where we have a control plane in front of our data centers, and we would need something like containers to make Borg possible. And so we helped build Linux containers. Uh, this is a bit of an inversion, my lights have gone off. <clears throat> uh, this is a bit of an inversion uh, because Really, you need something like Kubernetes in order to make containers practical because containers are taken off in a big way. <clears throat> and at some point you get into a situation, uh, I'm gonna show it in a minute, uh, where you have many containers. <clears throat> and having something like Kubernetes to manage your containers for you is vital. Uh, so let's give a quick recap of containers. I'm not gonna spend much time on this. You're probably all aware of what containers are by now. <clears throat> Pardon me, how my voice is going. 
I'm not sure where you all are in the world. Uh, I'm in San Francisco and it's very early in the morning here. All right. So containers, uh, generally lightweight, um, hermetically sealed. Not a word I like particularly well, but uh, it does kind of match the representation of a container. Uh, isolated, uh, very easy to deploy and move around. Uh, introspectable, you can look inside them and see what they're doing, uh, and they are runnable, and they're runnable anywhere uh, within many different environments. Uh, so they effectively look like Linux processes. <coughs> uh, the impact of them is that they improve the overall developer experience. Uh, they really do very much help with reuse, uh, and they simplify all of these operations for what today we're calling cloud native applications. And this is represented by things like uh, LXC, Rocket, and Docker. And I'm not really allowed to use the Docker logo anymore, so uh, that's my version of it. <coughs> okay, so what we get to is that we find that containers are awesome and we want to run lots of them. And that's when the inversion problem occurs where you need something like Kubernetes to manage them for you. you know, it's the exact inversion of what we had initially. So you want lots of containers uh, and Kubernetes is there for you uh, to provide this abstraction uh, on something. Now what that something is can be different depending on your on your needs. Uh, again we have this notion of a control plane, in this case an API, uh, which is represented by Kubernetes. And on the right hand side you have things like data centers, uh, like our data center in Council Bluffs, Iowa. You have potentially a, a Kubernetes cluster on a, a Raspberry Pi, um, a, a bunch of Raspberry Pis all stacked together. Uh, that's just there for fun. Uh, we built this, or we helped build it with a, a, other people in Amsterdam. Uh, it could be Google Cloud Platform. Uh, it could be Amazon Web Services. It could also be HP, Dell, IBM, on-premise machines, that kind of stuff. So pretty much the abstraction works on all of those environments, uh, which is extremely powerful. And with Cluster Federation, which we'll mention briefly at the end here, uh, it's potential to mix and match all of those together uh, so that we can sit a control plane in front of the control planes uh, effectively uh, to create a federated cluster. So Kubernetes, I'm going to look at the time. Okay, hope I'm not going too fast. I'm going to take a breather. Right, okay, so Kubernetes. I always say natives, everybody else says netis. Uh, I always learned it that way and I've always said it that way. Uh, to find out I was wrong is fairly scary considering I've been using it for three years. I like this graphic, this is from the docs. Uh, I like it because of, I like the notion of an ocean of user containers and I like the notion that we take that ocean of user containers and we schedule it and we pack it dynamically onto nodes, very much like Borg, what we've just described. Uh, so I think that's uh, an important summary of what Kubernetes gives us. Um, uh, we're not gonna talk much about the architecture of Kubernetes in this slide deck, I think I've missed that out but we are basically looking at a, a master slave system or master uh, node system. Uh, and nodes can run anywhere in a cluster and they can be on premise, they can be uh, in the cloud, um, they can be on a Raspberry Pi ultimately. And so I'm not gonna use this graphic to explain Kubernetes, so let's get into the details. So Kubernetes, what does it give us? Uh, so it helps decide where our containers should run. Uh, so when you have a container, all you have to do is tell Kubernetes, I wanna run this, uh, please run it for me. Uh, maybe you'll provide other uh, information about it and hook it up to other uh, components and other abstractions that are running within Kubernetes as well. It manages lifecycle and health of my containers. Uh, and we'll talk about the actual uh, runtime artifacts and the atom of scheduling uh, shortly, uh, but it will keep containers running uh, despite failures. And this is for some notion of containers. Containers are generally ephemeral and replaceable. Uh, making sure that we have the right number of containers running at any given time is what Kubernetes will do for us. Uh, also scaling, uh, we want to be able to make uh, sets of containers, uh, larger or smaller, uh, depending on traffic uh, or anticipated traffic. Uh, we want to be able to find out where containers are or where they're represented by services, where they, they're components of a microservices architecture or just generally a monolithic service uh, represented by container. We need to be able to name them and we need to be able to discover them. And believe me, people still build, build monoliths on containers today. Uh, low balancing, we want to be able to distribute traffic ac across some set of containers are running on our cluster somewhere, our cluster infrastructure, and potentially even across a federated cluster uh, today. We also want to be able to provide uh, storage volumes to our containers. Uh, 
everything needs to store data. Uh, we want to be able to log and monitor uh, what's happening within containers. <coughs> and <coughs> Kubernetes also provides debugging and introspection, so we can actually look at containers, look at what they're doing, attach them uh, and debug them as needed. And the final part is uh, make sure that uh, only the people we want to be able to do something uh, uh, with our containers can, can do those things uh, via identity and authorization. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm coughing into the microphone. So uh, that last part of the quick recap, uh, Kubernetes is one of, oh, at the end, three legs of cloud native. I'm not updated that. There are much more to cloud native now. Uh, you can go to CN, cncf.io to find out more about the cloud, cloud native computing foundation. Uh, but basically, uh, we talked about the architectures here, what it does, uh, containing packaged apps and uh, emitting microservice architectures. Uh, it's been around for around almost three years now, GA uh, since 2015. 1.6 is due in the end of March. Uh, we're currently at version 1.5. Uh, less than half the code is now written by Google. I couldn't find the latest version of the graphic, but you can see there it's 44% for Google. Uh, and it's stewarded uh, by the Cloud Native Compute Foundation and not by Google. Uh, so I think that's important as well if you want to know about independence. Uh, Kubernetes is also very stable. Uh, it comes from all of those learnings we talked about earlier. Uh, ten years of over ten years now of production experience uh, and mistakes, things that we've learned over the years uh, with Borg, uh, are represented by Kubernetes. I often talk about Borg being something that we built up over time. We've added stuff. Uh, imagine a house with lots of extensions all over the place, coming backwards and forwards and high up. Um, and it. It's very solid, it's sound, it does what it needs to do, and it does it extremely well. Uh, but at times you want to tear the whole thing down and start again. And Kubernetes is kind of like reimagining what Borg does uh, externally from Google. Uh, we're unlikely to port to Kubernetes anytime soon uh, because we have so much dependency on, on Borg. Uh, but if we're going to build something from scratch outside of Borg, uh, then this is what Kubernetes is effectively. Uh, we're guaranteeing that no breaking changes will be introduced uh, until version two with v1 uh, so that's important for everybody uh, that uses it we have different tracks <coughs> uh, for introducing new features uh, both alpha and beta we have significant feature sets uh, in beta currently uh, and obviously your ga tracks guaranteed certain levels of uh, of <coughs> uh, stability we do thorough end-to-end -end testing uh, through the community. Um, we help with that as well at Google. Uh, and there's lots of new work taking place outside of the core commit uh, process of Kubernetes. Uh, and most of this is accessible from the GitHub, uh, the GitHub uh, uh, project. You can find out more about all of this ongoing work. Uh, Kubernetes also has a very solid core. <clears throat> We're going to talk about some of these primitives soon, uh, not all of them. Oh, pet set mentioned there. Sorry, I should be. Uh, Stateful set, we'll cover that shortly. <coughs> My voice is definitely struggling here. Uh, so yeah, so these are the uh, core concepts. I don't like talking about bullet points around individual things that may be complicated to understand. Uh, but we also do have a, a Kubernetes um, uh, ecosystem that's extremely healthy uh, and it's supported by uh, very large companies. Uh, different distros, uh, different cloud providers, uh, different platforms of service offerings, uh, uh, continuous deployment offerings, uh, various package managers, monitoring, networking, storages, uh, storage and appliances. Uh, this may not be up to date uh, completely, uh, but it's going to be more instead of less. Uh, and also we have great momentum. Uh, as of this morning, 43,765 commits uh, to the GitHub repository and 1,078 contributors, uh, including many uh, important companies as listed below uh, that number. So Kubernetes, uh, we go back to a picture that looks it's remarkably similar to what we saw earlier with Borg and with uh, our initial abstraction of what Kubernetes would look like. Uh, our developers uh, are accessing a Kubernetes cluster via a control plane, uh, which is the API. Uh, somewhere within the cluster, we have machines. Uh, as a developer, we don't care what those machines or those nodes are. Uh, it's really only something that the control plane, which in this case is the Kubernetes master and scheduler, uh, need to know about. Uh, so we have these servers, we have the control plane, and developers can access them via 
uh, either the API, which is extremely common. This can be made use of by many third party tools as well. Uh, you can use the CLI, the command line interface, uh, the, the, the kube CTL command uh, and other commands now. Uh, and also the user interface, which is <clears throat> still very much a work in progress. Uh, many people like to build their own user interfaces uh, in front of Kube, um, uh, Kubernetes. Uh, that gives them a lot of flexibility and allows them to integrate Kubernetes uh, by CI CD into their own workflows. Um, so uh, the dashboard, uh, the user interface has never really been a huge priority um, for Kubernetes. So ultimately what you do to get started with Kubernetes is uh, you start with a cluster. Uh, you need some machines to be able to run this on. Uh, that could be as simple as a laptop. You can run Kubernetes today uh, on uh, a laptop or you can run it uh, in a high availability multi-node cluster. Um, it can be hosted or you can manage it yourself. Uh, we have an example of that hosting uh, in Google Container Engine. Um, and there are other distros as well that provide hosted offerings of Kubernetes. Uh, you can manage it yourself. It could be on premise or, or cloud as we've already established. And it could also be on bare metal or on virtual machines. Uh, supported by most operating systems. Uh, and can just run on just a bunch of uh, Raspberry Pis, which is something we did at DevOps last year uh, with Quintor uh, from uh, Amersfoort in near Amsterdam. There are many, many different options. Uh, there's a matrix down there, a link. I've not actually checked the link for uh, whether it's still updated. I'm sure it probably is. I'm sure it probably is. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Uh, but I should update that later. I'll share these slides with you afterwards. Uh, setting up a cluster, there's various different ways of getting started. Uh, if you want on-prem, we've recently introduced the kube ADM command, uh, which can be used to configure masters and nodes on a, in an on-premise environment. Uh, there's also this thing called COPS, uh, and I've not looked back on this for a while to see what kind of traction it's getting. But this was designed to specifically run on AWS, uh, run Kubernetes on AWS. Although the plan was for it not to be limited to AWS, but it does simplify deployment and get enough money in because uh, on some environments, it's the networking is all taken care of for you. On AWS, you have to run things like uh, uh, Flannel, that kind of thing to be able to run Kubernetes uh, and COPS takes care of that for you. Uh, you can choose a platform, uh, whether it's on Google Cloud Platform, Azure, Ubuntu, Juju, uh, and you can just run it from the command line. Uh, you get the script. I wouldn't recommend using the curl command anymore. I don't think people do this anymore. Uh, I think it may still be in the docs like this, uh, but you can specify your Kubernetes provider uh, and pull down the script, uh, and run the script, and that will install Kubernetes for you in your environment of choice. Uh, you can choose a distro uh, like Red Hat Atomic uh, Tectonic, uh, Marantas Murano, Mesos, uh, or you can build from scratch. Uh, and there's a, we search for Kubernetes the hard way. Uh, one of our guys, Kelsey Hightower, has a walkthrough of how to build uh, Kubernetes completely from scratch. Uh, let's get into the abstractions of Kubernetes. And the first one is uh, a pod, a pod of containers. Uh, we don't actually run con containers, we don't schedule containers specifically, we have this notion of a thing called a pod. Uh, and this is probably the hardest thing to get your head around. It's fairly simple, but you, the biggest question is normally why a pod? Why do we need this thing? Why can't we just schedule containers? And this generally really is kind of a mismatch between the way Docker works uh, and uh, uh, the way the infrastructure works and the way we need the infrastructure to work. Uh, we'll look at networking shortly. There are some things we actually require that were not available in Docker uh, when Docker came along. And uh, so we have this abstraction called a pod. Uh, and a pod looks pretty much like a, a logical, uh, a virtual representation of a logical host. Uh, not a VM, but looking like a host and being able to run things like a host. It has its own IP address. It can run containers and mount volumes. Um, and uh, <clears throat> ultimately we can run multiple containers with inside a pod uh, together when there's a need to. Uh, this isn't uh, the idea of building monoliths. Uh, it's not to facilitate building monoliths, but often you find containers need to run side by side. And we have various different patterns for that, uh, often called sidecar containers uh, or adapter containers, uh, things that do things that offer value to the running container. 
Uh, we look at App Engine today, App Engine Flexible environment, which has a container and a memcache container that runs side by side with it. Uh, and those containers will live and die together. Uh, so uh, we have an example on the next slide, I believe. Uh, but they also support liveness and readiness checks, and they have post start and pre stop lifecycle hooks uh, that can help with uh, teardown and uh, creation. <clears throat> Here's an example of where we'd run multiple containers within a pod. Uh, in this case, we have uh, a Node.js application container serving traffic to consumers uh, by an abstraction we'll talk about shortly called a service. Uh, and we have a, another container that's running side by side within the pod that's monitoring a Git, hub re uh, a Git repo. And whenever pushes are <clears throat> made to the Git repo, uh, the Git sync container sees those pushes, pulls down the content, stores it on a, a volume, which we'll talk about shortly as well. And that can now be updated and served by the Node.js applic application container. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> here we have a, a lifecycle dependency. Uh, those things need to live together. Uh, they are matched together. And when one goes away, the other can go away as well. Uh, so it makes sense to run them inside a pod. They do simplify networking for us as well. Um, and these containers share effectively port namespaces and IPC namespaces, and they can talk to each other through localhost, just like they're running on a host machine. Uh, so if you can imagine building this machine physically and just then mapping it to a pod and then pushing it out into Kubernetes to say, this is what that machine would have looked like, a virtual representation of that, now running as a pod. Uh, pod networking is an important concept for us because uh, there are some requirements that we have and uh, this where some of the complexity of Kubernetes comes in, uh, which is generally going away uh, with things like COPS, uh, whereby we need uh, to have a network layer that allows pods uh, to have uh, their own routable IP addresses that's unique within the cluster, uh, which means we can actually access each of these pods uh, individually by IP address uh, or ultimately via a DNS lookup. Uh, it's extremely powerful. So these blue boxes here are nodes, uh, and uh, we have other blue, dark blue services running within the node. Uh, but the pod is scheduled on the node. It has its own IP address, uh, and these things can expose the same port. Uh, so like in the middle example, where we have uh, 10.1.1.211 and 10.1.1.2. They could both be exposed in the same port. They're both run on the same host, but because of the networking overlay that we use, uh, that's perfectly okay. Uh, that's not a problem. We can schedule multiple pods uh, of the same type or, or each exposing the same port on uh, a single node. Uh, and that's extremely powerful. Uh, so no broker in the port numbers at all. Uh, and pods can reach each other without using that, uh, even when they're uh, on different nodes. There are many different solutions. And again, I'll probably need to update this list a little bit. Uh, you can use things like Fanel, Weave, Calico, Open vSwitch, or you can make use of your cloud provider. Uh, and this is what Google Container Engine does, or when you're using running Kubernetes outside a Container Engine on Google Cloud Platform virtual machines, uh, you get this for free because it's supported by our network infrastructure. And uh, so that makes it very simple to use. So that's how pods work. And this is one of the reasons why we have pods because of the networking. Ultimately, pods are built from some kind of spec template. Uh, basically, this is uh, something that can be uh, recreated. Uh, they're completely fungible. Uh, they can be replaced. Uh, they're completely ephemeral as well. Uh, but they're functionally identical. And we just build a pod from a spec template that we've created. Uh, and uh, we can have as many copies of that, many replicas of that as we like across the cluster. Uh, we're going to get into more details of that and see some more examples. One of the powerful mechanisms, uh, one of the much needed mechanisms within Kubernetes is a grouping mechanism called labels. Uh, and we can group pods, we can group uh, other uh, semantic abstractions as well uh, using these labels. Uh, effectively, every resource within a uh, Kubernetes cluster can be uh, labeled in some way. It includes nodes. Uh, and the most powerful abstraction you'll find or powerful use of them is with pods, uh, where we're going to group pods together. Uh, so now we mentioned that pods are created from a, a spec template. Uh, in this case, these two pods are uh, functionally identical. Uh, they are fungible, they are replaceable, uh, and they both have the same label, which means we can now build other abstractions or tooling even that can say, I care about all of the pods with the label type equals FE. And in this case, uh, well, in all cases, labels are key value pairs. Uh, they have semantic meaning to you, 
uh, but not to Kubernetes. Okay, so uh, for the most part, uh, there are some labels that may have some magic minions of Kubernetes, but most mostly not. In this case, you'll say type equals FE because you care about pods that are front end pods uh, and you define that type. And now we can build a dashboard uh, of some kind that can that cares about all of those pods and you can make API calls to Kubernetes and say, give me all of the pods with label type equals FE. Or we can have another dashboard, and in this case we have version equals v2, and we built another dashboard or another abstraction that can uh, that cares about version equals v2. Pods can have multiple labels, uh, and they can be uh, similar to this uh, this uh, structure here. There maybe there's some difference between the pod in the middle and the pod on the left, uh, both from the type equals FE, but this one is a later version of it, and we look at the Canary and, and other uh, abstractions shortly. Uh, these things are queryable by selectors, and you can do that by the API, uh, or Kubernetes can do it as well. Then we have the notion of a replica replica set, and a replica set uh, manages uh, uh, a number of running pods that are uh, functionally identical, built from the same spec template we mentioned earlier. Uh, my, that's something wrong there with my picture. Yeah, okay, anyway, uh, normally I'm not convinced that that's correct because well, maybe it would be, yeah, okay. Uh, so basically when we create pods, we give them labels. <clears throat> uh, we also have this ability to create a replica set and a replica set will uh, is an abstraction that comes up. We, we build a re replica set, we tell it how many pods it needs uh, and we provide it with a template. Uh, it knows how to build pods from that template. So in this case, what we have is some kind of template. We're saying we want three of this template. When the replication replica set comes up, um, it looks outside in the cluster to see if there are pods that match that label. <coughs> if it finds them, then it, it starts effectively managing their life cycle for us. <coughs> if it doesn't find them, it will create them for us from the template. Uh, so in this case, this works. Uh, we have three different pods with effectively two different labels. The replica set probably didn't create all, all three of these. It probably created the first two and it is managing the last one uh, because it has a slightly different label, uh, label configuration. But effectively what we're saying here for the replica set is, I want three of these, this is my template. Please make sure there are always three of these running at any given time. Uh, and it will be effectively a control loop. Uh, we'll continue to monitor that. It will look to see if there are three of these running. If it finds there are four running, it will take one away. If it finds there are two running, it will add one. And it will use the template to create that. It is possible we can update the replica set uh, and we can effectively then tear down the pods and recreate new ones. Uh, that's a thing called a deployment which we'll look at shortly. But ultimately these things make sure uh, we have uh, a desired state. Uh, we used to use this term quite uh, regularly, uh, desired state. Uh, it manages that desired state. This is the state of the pods that we want uh, to have running um, and it will manage that for us. <clears throat> deployments effectively take that one step further. Uh, what we used to be able to do is provide some kind of rolling update uh, for a controller. Uh, effectively, what we would have would be a, a replica set uh, that managed a bunch of pods, uh, and we want to be able to update each of those pods to a new version. That would involve creating a new replica set. In those days, it was called a replication controller, and we would basically tear down one pod from the old version and bring up one pod on a new version until we had replaced them completely. But that process was driven completely from the client side, from the actual kube CTL, the command line tool. Uh, we do all of that work by issuing API calls and it was completely interruptible, uh, which means if you control seed it or something went wrong, uh, it would leave the uh, entire configuration in an unknown state. We may have X number of new pods and X number of old pods. Um, we may even have the wrong number of pods. So what we did is move that inside the cluster uh, via a deployment. And so uh, deployments effectively offer updates as a service. We say how many pods we want to run. Uh, we provide the template um, and we ask the deployment to manage that via a replica set. 
Uh, so now what we can do is we can roll out updates to deployment say, hey, I've updated my configuration. Here's a new template or I want more of these. Please do this for me. And the deployment within inside the cluster will take care of those changes. Uh, I think I have a demo of it soon, but not sure. Um, <coughs> uh, Mm, we'll get to it in a second. But anyway, effectively, they can manage changes uh, such as rolling updates. And they can do all the scaling for us. Uh, we can actually edit a configuration on the command line. Uh, we can issue a command called kubectl edit, which will pull down the configuration of the deployment and allow us to edit it. Uh, once we have applied the changes, uh, they will be pushed out to the cluster and it will enact those changes by updating the pods uh, within the deployment. Uh, and we can manage rollouts and rollbacks as well. Uh, this is a much more powerful mechanism and it's completely managed on the cluster. Uh, then we have the abstraction of services. Uh, services, um, oh, okay, uh, my slide animation's broken a little bit. Pods can run anywhere within the cluster. Uh, pods are ephemeral, their IPs are not stable. And we may, we may have many replicas of the same pod running within the cluster. That's interesting, but how does that help us? Uh, we have this situation here. How do we get access to them and how do pods find each other? Uh, we may have multiple microservices deployed within the cluster. Uh, we may need to come in externally to be able to find those pods. Uh, how does that work? Um, and how do we route traffic to them ultimately? And that's done through something called a service. And so now we take this, uh, the pod abstraction, they have labels. Uh, in this case, we have app equals backend. And we're gonna stick this other abstraction in front of them called a service, which cares about pods with the label type equals FE, or sorry, app equals backend in this case. I need to update that slide. And then basically what can happen, what will happen via a virtual IP uh, provided by that service, uh, other pods can find that service and access those other pods. Uh, external services can do that and we can route traffic to uh, them all via this virtual IP. And the virtual IP gets a DNS entry as well, uh, so we can discover it uh, via DNS. Uh, so this effectively aggregates all of those pods into a service. Uh, it may be a microservice, it may be a, a one-off service that we're running across the cluster, uh, but this is the mechanism we use to be able to communicate with running pods within the cluster. Uh, choice of the pod for routing is currently random. Uh, it used to be round robin, uh, but we do support session affinity via client IP. Uh, and the virtual IP address is stable, uh, as is the DNS name. Okay, so that's what a service does. We also have another abstraction uh, or another version of a service called uh, a node port, which allows us to Rather than having to worry about where the service is running and route traffic to it, we can actually expose a port on every single node within the cluster. And then that would be our service. And that would effectively route traffic to any running pod within the cluster. Uh, so we don't need to do discovery. We just need to know where the node is. And that may just be an IP address. Uh, so we point to a node, hit the, uh, hit the port, and that incoming traffic, incoming request will be routed to uh, a running pod within the cluster uh, that exposes that service. Uh, there's also DIY load balancer solutions. Oh, the load balancer one is what we just saw. Uh, DIY load balancer solutions such as SOCAT, HAProxy, and Nginx. And we also have this thing called uh, Ingress. And Ingresses provide, um, maybe not in beta, I'm not sure. Some of these things, it's really hard to find out what's in beta and what's in alpha nowadays with, with Kubernetes. Uh, I should probably look into that. But basically, the idea we have two services uh, and we have to access them via their own DNS names or via their own IP addresses independently of each other. Uh, but maybe we want to route traffic through a single endpoint uh, and Ingress gives us that ability. So in this case, we have two services uh, and they have pods that they represent, uh, which may be name equals foo, name equals bar, which is the, the label for those pods. Uh, and when we route traffic to them, we have to go to the virtual IP or to its DNS name. Uh, what we can do with an ingress, we can stick uh, uh, this ingress in front of it, which will allow us to have a single uh, DNS entry, uh, external DNS entry, or a single IP, which will route traffic based on URL. Uh, and in this case, we have service foo and service bar being having traffic routed and through uh, the URL path foo and the URL path bar. Uh, so this is extremely powerful as well. This was introduced a while back. Uh, I also want to talk about scaling as well. We do this via a replica set, but also via a deployment, which manages the whole thing for us. Uh, we 
start off with one pod. We have a pod and a service in front of it. The pod has a label version equals V1, type equals FE. Uh, the service cares about um, uh, labels with type equals FE and the replica set cares about label version equals V1. Um, it effectively provides that kind of diagrammatical form there. Uh, they are using different labels um, and that's important when we look at Canary and shortly. What we do is we say to the replica set, I want two of these. And now the replica set spin in again, this control, control loop, it says, oh, I should have two of these, but I've only got one of them. So it will now issue an API call and we'll create a new uh, version that pod from the template that it has. Again, the same labels as before. And given that it has the same labels as before, which is defined as part of the template, the service will now pick up that new pod uh, and automatically route traffic to it uh, once it's online. And if we say four pods, exactly the same happens. We have an extra two pods, again, the same label. And now we have four pods, the services routing traffic across all four of those pods. And the next thing is a rollout. Uh, I want to kind of just go through this. Oh, my graphics are broken again. Uh, in this case, we have a replica set uh, with two pods. Uh, version equals V1 and a service with type equals BE. Uh, the service is the green box at the bottom. <clears throat> We're not gonna worry about the service too much in this, but we want to be able to update the pods. Uh, maybe we have a new version, version equals V2, uh, that we want to roll out. Um, and we can do this using uh, something like kube CTL edit deployment. In this case, we will issue that command. Uh, we may edit some factor of the pod template. In this case, let's imagine we're changing the image. So we built a new uh, container image, and we pushed it out to a repository, and now we want to, which could be Docker Hub, it could be our Google Container Registry, we run on Google Container Engine, uh, but we now want to update our pods with that new image. So we edit the deployment, uh, we could be doing this by CI, CD, uh, and once the deployment sees those changes, it will be responsible for updating the pods. The first thing it will do will be create a new front end, uh, a new replica set. Uh, the replica set will have a different name slightly. It's hashed, uh, so it's created dynamically, the name. Uh, but it cares about pods with version equals V2. And initially it has no pods. And then we scale that up to one. Uh, the replica set again spinning will say, oh, I should have one of these pods. My new template here, it will create the pod. Uh, version equals V2, type equals BE. Again, it's aggregated by the service. Uh, the next thing we need to do is to downscale the existing replica set, and we take both of those away. Uh, we have here a situation whereby we only had one pod serving at any given time. You can control that. Uh, so like if you want, uh, there's a thing called max surge and uh, max overhead, I can't remember what it's called, uh, but basically you can define what, uh, how many you can have over the number you really require and how many below the number you really require. In this case, the, the default setting was to be uh, one less uh, uh, and what we had is a situation where we only had one pod running at one time. Uh, we could make sure that we always have two running by changing those parameters. But effectively what's happened now is we, we've replaced the running pods with two new pods uh, that are built on the, set, on the new image that we created when we edited the, uh, the, the deployment. The old replica set will continue to exist. It uh, uh, doesn't take up much in terms of resources. It has no pods attached to it. If we ever needed to do a rollback, we would reuse that replica set. We could roll back that update and go back to the original configuration just by issuing one command. That's really powerful. Uh, and Canary is another situation where we find ourselves in. We may have two running pods, version equals V1, uh, and managed by a replica set and abstracted out to a service. We may want to test uh, an update uh, to our container image. Uh, and what we can do in that case is create a new replica set, uh, again, with one of the labels being type equals BE, so it's still aggregated by the service, and one label is being version equals V2, which means it's being managed by this different replica set. Uh, now we're routing traffic between two different versions of our pod, V1 and V2. Uh, so effectively 66% of our traffic is going to the older pods and what 33% is going to the newer pod. Uh, we can then decide at some point that 
the change that we rolled out is good uh, and we can then update the deployment to uh, for the first replica set to use a new image uh, or we can roll back and tear down the replica set and start again and try try a, a different version that, that's something we do often at Google Canarian we have a very small percentage of our uh, deployed services on the newer version we can monitor how that's performing if it's performing well we can roll out the change across the entire application or we can roll it back and go back to where we were, where we were before that's very very easy to do within Kubernetes uh, auto scaling is also extremely powerful uh, in this case we have a replica set that manages uh, two pods um, this is an example I used at DevOps which is why it's got strange labels uh, and we are monitoring the uh, CPU utilization of those pods for a thing called Heapster, uh, which runs as a pod within the cluster. This is all automatic, you get this for free. Uh, and we set a scale target of CPU uh, percentage equals 50. Uh, what we're looking for is if the CPU percentage gets greater than 50, we want to be able to uh, update. Uh, or add new pods uh, on demand. So initially the replica set is uh, set to pods equals two. Uh, we now have this loop whereby we're monitoring uh, traffic. If at some point the CPU goes above 50%, uh, which it has in this case, uh, we will, via the scale uh, resource, we will add, uh, we will ask the replica set to add new pods. So we change the replica set number of pods to four and it will take care of running the new pods and ultimately now the CPU utilization drops down below 50% and we now have a stable environment uh, whenever that goes uh, <clears throat> whenever we need to we we can tear down pods as well using that same mechanism uh, scheduling we've mentioned scheduling before within the context of uh, uh, Borg I'm not going to spend too much time on it uh, we've only got 10 minutes left nine minutes left oh wow uh, but Kubernetes without a scheduler uh, does work. You don't have to schedule things uh, for Kubernetes. You can specify by this label here, a node name uh, within your pod spec. Uh, I want it to run on a specific node. Uh, you could do that if you wanted to. Uh, that's not how you should do it, uh, but that is possible. And that's how Kubernetes would, would schedule a pod uh, if it didn't have a scheduler. But what we do have is a scheduler component uh, that effectively allows us to say, hey, just run this for me, and it will make the scheduling decisions for us. So it will ultimately look at uh, the pod, look at the cluster, uh, and it will make a decision on where to schedule that. And that's all dynamic and handled for us. Uh, and ultimately, the BIM packing components of that will come along within Kubernetes in the future. We don't quite have all of that yet. It doesn't quite match Borg, but it's going to get there ultimately. Uh, I just want to mention volumes very quickly. I don't have much time. Uh, we need to be able to uh, share state uh, or have state within uh, the cluster. Uh, and this is provided by volumes, which will be effectively mounted by the containers running inside a pod. Uh, and pods, uh, containers within a pod can share that same volume uh, that's mounted. We have multiple different representations of volumes, including an empty directory, which lives within the pod. Uh, this is backed by storage, but it's completely ephemeral. Uh, when the pod goes away, the storage goes away. So it's used for anything that's transient, uh, temporary storage, that kind of thing. Uh, we have a host path. We can actually map uh, a directory on the node itself uh, into uh, a container uh, as a volume. Uh, use, with, use this with caution. Uh, often nodes are different. We know that the operating system, the underlying operating system environment may change in such a way that uh, what we see within that host path may differ from node to node. Uh, so this isn't necessarily recommended. Uh, you can use NFS or ClusterFS uh, and others nowadays uh, to mount uh, a volume. Uh, you can also use cloud provider uh, or block or file storage. Um, and this AWS and Google Cloud Platform both provide this facility. Uh, so this will map to a, a Google Cloud Platform persistent, uh, persistent disk or to an AWS block storage device. We can also use a thing called a persistent volume claim as well. Uh, and these things uh, change one thing about what we talked about before, that they live as long as the pod does. Uh, these things can live beyond the life of a pod. Uh, and we use them to basically ask the uh, underlying cluster to provide the volume for us. Uh, we set out uh, a requirement in terms of size, uh, maybe in terms of identity as well, and it will give us that volume. Uh, uh, where it's possible. It may not be able to, it may have to schedule that. It may be we're asking for a terabyte's worth of disk storage when we don't have a terabyte available. Uh, so that request will be queued and will be given to us when it becomes available. 
So persistent volumes uh, effectively uh, uh, isolate us from any specific cloud environment uh, or on-premise environment. Uh, administrators generally provision them uh, and users claim them uh, via these uh, uh, templates and specs we've talked about before. Uh, we can also do dynamic provisioning of these as well. So once we ask for a claim, the underlying uh, uh, cluster can provision them for us. Uh, they have a, an independent lifetime from the things that use them. Uh, so they live until the user is done with them. You can actually control the life cycle, determine, determine whether they should be recycled or whether they should be reused uh, and handed off effectively between different pods. Uh, and they can be dynamically scheduled and managed just like nodes and pods. Uh, clustered applications. Uh, so this is a problem that Kubernetes is now trying to address through a thing called stateful sets. Uh, with a clustered application such as Cassandra, uh, nodes have a unique identity which is coupled to data on the disk. Um, and nodes may effectively have to be configured and initialized in a certain way uh, or in a certain order. Uh, this is, as you can probably imagine, from Kubernetes a little bit more complicated. Uh, so we've introduced this thing called a stateful set. Um, uh, basically stateful sets again do what we've done with replica sets in the past. They stamp out identical copies of a pod, uh, but they do make sure that each, has, each one has a unique identity and they allow each one of them to have its own reusable persistent storage. And that looks something like this. This is a pod effectively. Uh, it's called DB0. They have ordinality. Uh, so part of their name is a, an ordinal number, in this case DB0, and they are matched to a, a persistent volume called PVDB-0 in this case. Naming obviously will be different depending on what you're deploying. Uh, but they are consistent. Uh, and when you create the next one, or if you scale, maybe from one to two, maybe you ask for 10 initially, and it will do this automatically. Or maybe you scale and, and add new pods. Uh, but the next one will be called DB1, uh, same with the, with the persistent volume. And the next one will be called DB2, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that ordinality is important, and that sense of identity is important as well. So basically, you're going to say to the master, uh, I want three of these, uh, hmm, three of these and it will create three for you. The first one will be DB0, it will create a position volume claim, and that volume will be uh, assigned either from a new volume that was created for specifically for this deployment, or it will give you one that already exists, one with that identity that it understands completely already. And the next one we create, DB1, uh, the same thing would happen. We create the position volume claim, and that's matched with either an existing uh, volume or a new volume, and DB2 would be the same. And what we can do is at any point we can take two of those away, uh, but the position volume continue to exist. And when we add them back again, they will map to the same volume. So now they have this sense of identity and they have their own stateful storage. So now we can do things like uh, the clustered applications that we talked about earlier, things like Cassandra. Uh, another component for that is something called in initialization containers. So when we spin up a pod, we can also spin up this notion of an init container, uh, which will, uh, perform different functions. They, they basically work till they're finished. Uh, they can be used for bootstrapping effectively. Uh, normally when we have a, a, a pod, we build the containers within that pod from an image. Uh, that would be called baking. Uh, but you can also bootstrap these things by providing configuration based on the environment. Uh, so your init container could come up, it can look outside uh, the rest of the environment, make decisions based on that, and then configure the containers, the other containers that will be running based on that environment. Uh, we can use this for uh, discovery of peers uh, using peer finder scripts and sidecars. Uh, we can use it for uh, startup and teardown ordering, which is absolutely vital for something like Cassandra, uh, for master elections and also ultimately implicit ordering. Uh, and those things are uh, available today. Uh, all of that's in beta currently. Uh, Init containers and staple sets are introduced in 1.3. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, any containers are beta in 1.4 and stateful sets are now beta in 1.5. Uh, I'm going to skip over the rest. Uh, I'll provide the slides for you, but you can do configuration uh, coming from the environment, provide configuration uh, via a resource. You can provide secrets via a resource. Uh, and the last part is multi-cluster uh, federation. Ultimately, we can have our control plane match multiple clusters. Uh, within different availability zones. Uh, so this could be uh, something running on uh, AWS uh, with different clusters or parts of uh, a federated cluster running in different availability zones. Or we can also have uh, different 
clusters are uh, parts of that federation running in different places uh, in Google Cloud Platform in Amazon or on-premise as well. Uh, cluster federation is still a working process uh, where where sorry to interrupt but we've yep. got about 30 seconds left. Yeah I'm just about to finish okay cool so I will share these slides with you uh, we have a, a very very uh, large community uh, it's uh, extremely powerful normally it's messages for people who've never heard it before and I also mentioned Niantic, we run Pokemon Go on Kubernetes, uh, in case you didn't know. Uh, and that's it. So basically that's the, the entire talk. I've not left, left time for questions, but you can send them to me via Stan. Uh, Stan, is that okay? Yeah, perfectly well. Thank you very much, Mandy. It was a great presentation. I'm sorry I, sorry I didn't leave time for questions. Uh, 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 but, but feel free to just throw them at me and I will do my best to answer them. Some of the questions you've already sent to Stan are a little bit, uh, uh, need to, need need me to do some investigation, but I will do my best to answer them over the next few days. Uh, if you have any more, send them to Stan, and he'll send them to me. Great. Thank you very much, Mandy. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye.